Cool. Um, I'll just start. Uh, this is building a stronger community, Drupal diversity and inclusion. Um, I am not good with slides. <laughs> There we go. I'm Tara, I'm a customer success engineer at Pantheon. Thank you to them for bringing me here. And I'm everywhere as sparkling robots, if you want to reach me. Yeah. It's my co-presenter. And I'm Ruby Sinreich. Everybody wants to know how to say my last name, but I really don't care how you say it. But, because I know people are curious, it's Sinreich. Um, and I work at Moms Rising as the in-house developer there. Um, and we are both uh, uh, leaders of Drupal, Drupal diversity and inclusion. Um, should I say the collective? <laughs> um, cool. So, um, what we're going to do today? The bulk of this talk, and some I, some of you all I know know a lot of these things, um, but we're going to talk about the issues around diversity and inclusion. We're going to sort of explain these key concepts. We'll talk a little bit about statistics, how Drupal compares to others, um, and then we'll talk about specifically about what Drupal diversity and inclusion itself is doing, um, or ourselves. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'm going to be doing a bunch of the first slides, and then Tara's going to do a bunch of the next slides. Okay. So um, this is just, just to get some, so that we have some common vocabulary. Um, diversity, the word diversity as we're using it, means like representation. When you look around the room, like kind of what sort of people do you see, that kind of thing. Whereas inclusion is is a more meaningful involvement. And it's not that diversity is not important and inclusion is important, it's that you have to have both and lots more that we're gonna talk about. Um, but that's why, a lot of people ask, why do, you, why do you use these terms? That's what these terms mean. Um, so some of, some of the basic, uh, I'll say like first level reasons, the obvious reasons why these things are important. Um, when you have different kinds of people, you get different kinds of ideas. You come up with more creative things, a lot of us in, um, in, in the web community are trying to be creative, trying to be innovative. And so one way to do that is to bring in different people with different ideas. Um, it also changes the group dynamic to have different people involved. And that can also lead to more creative thinking. Um, and, and another thing that that can cause is processes taking longer, which people think is bad. But a lot of times it's better, right? Democracy can be messy. Collaboration is messy. But, it, but it's, it's an investment in a better outcome. So don't expect for, to, to you know, change who's sitting at the table and then keep doing things exactly how they used to be. You might have to explain more things and, and learn more about each other. Um, so um, another outcome, which is important for some people, is it actually does tend to lead, studies have shown, um, that uh, more diverse and inclusive uh, organizations have better outcomes um, whether it's profits or other measures of success. And it's because of all those reasons, like better ideas, better processes, and things like that. Um, and th it also avoids, there are costs to exclusion, um, which a lot of us really don't think about. And it's something that's been coming up a lot this week in talking about the Drupal community, like who's not here? And are we thinking about um, the costs of losing people who get tired of having to battle for their space all the time? Um, and feel free to jump in whenever. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Um, so, so that's sort of our, that's the warm up, okay? Now, I am going to try in like less than 20 minutes to talk about stuff that has taken me over 20 years to learn. Um, so it's going to go kind of fast. Do feel free to stop me if I am just like speeding through and you're like, what the hell? Um, but also bear with us and hopefully we will get there. We have a lot of explaining we're going to try to do. <laughs> um, and also, I want to explain the way I do slides um, because I really like to read and see things. A lot of people like to do the beautiful, just an image slide and talk about stuff, but I don't learn well uh, through hearing. So uh, these slides will have a visual and words, but if words distract you, you don't need them. You can just listen to us. Um, so don't worry about like trying to read everything on the slide or something like that. That's just, they're just, the words are there to help if, if they're helpful, and if they're not, skip them. <laughs> um, so, everybody has values. Um, you have things that you love. You have art that you love. You have technology that you hate. You hate Flash. Um, you love clean CSS. Whatever it is, right? There's things you like and you don't like. Those are biases that we all have. They're not necessarily good or bad. Every, everybody has them. 
um, nobody is really neutral. Everybody has, everybody has their own biases that make them part of who they are. Um, and whatever we make is a result of those biases. Um, so one of the things we need to understand is to be aware of our biases. And, that bring, and it, it ties back into that thing about having different people around the room who may bring in different biases or values or things like that. Um, one of the problems that we see, especially when you get, uh, when there's one group that's overly dominant, is they tend to think of themselves as the default. Um, this is the experience that certain people have in society. They get images of themselves reflected back to themselves, and they think they are the default, and everyone else is the other. Um, and so that when they make things, the things they make are value neutral, but then other people are embedding their ideas in it. But in fact, we're all embedding our values and our opinions into things. Um, so, one, there's, this is one great story, and then uh, the one that's been in the news lately is even better. Um, in the last week, you heard about two Google, uh, or two um, hiring algorithms, right? Is everybody seen those stories? Um, one of them was Amazon's, and the other one was like a, a, a company, like an yeah. HR company. Um, they were making algorithms to screen resumes. The data they fed into it was the past hiring at, say, at Amazon or whatever. And so the output of the algorithm was that it ranked women lower. Any resume that mentioned a women's anything, a women's sports team, women who code, whatever it might be, was ranked lower. Um, the other algorithm that was also in the news last week ranked people with the name Jared higher, people who played, high, played lacrosse higher, people who played women's sports lower. Um, or in this case, where um, this is from a couple of years ago, study was in 2017, but as, as uh, Facebook was training the moderators, they had this idea that um, they, the censors don't allow hate speech against protected categories, white males, but it's okay to have hate speech against subsets, which they define as female drivers or black children. <laughs> um, so again, it's people making a lot of assumptions as they're making these rules. Because, because they see themselves as the default or as they think they understand the categories. And they're literally building bias into the systems, into the systems that we're using to communicate with each other. Um, so um, not only, so this is, so that's one of the most important things, honestly, that I want people to take away and think about is what are, the, what are all the assumptions and values that we're baking into our stuff. Um, but if our software that we're making has our values encoded in it, so does our whole society. The institutions that we create over hundreds and thousands of years also have our values embedded in them. And when you think about who has been creating most of the institutions that we live with, it is mostly uh, powerful, white, Christian, heterosexual men, right? They've created these institutions for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, this, this is actually maybe a bad example because it's from Egypt and they're not white, but um, but you see how society gets structured, right? Um, so that um, you get to generations of injustice. Um, and I'm going to talk about systemic injustice in a minute. Um, but this, this great uh, sociologist had this great explanation. <laughs> Actually, this is my thing about structural inequality. Um, there's, there's individual bias. There's people being racism. You know, we all think of that as like hate speech or Nazis or whatever, right? But even individuals who don't have any individual bias can still perpetuate the systems where um, there are unequal outcomes built into the institutions that produce inequality even in the absence of biased individuals. It doesn't rely on an individual being racist for racism or white supremacy to be built into the system because those values have been embedded in, literally, again, for generations. So, we get to the P word. Um, some people really don't like to talk about this. But um, when you think about how, this, how we have structural inequality, it makes you realize that if you are benefiting from structural inequality, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You didn't make those structures, right? And so it's not your fault, it's nobody's fault that you're white, that I'm white, and I enjoy white privilege. I can't not enjoy white privilege. I cannot enjoy it, but I can't not have it. <laughs> um, I, I don't enjoy it actually a lot of the time, but I have it no matter what. Um, and so uh, I, I also don't have other things. I don't have male privilege, things like that. 
So um, if, if you're familiar with John Scalzi, he's a very popular science fiction writer. He has great, great blog post in 2012. We wrote this whole thing, this whole story about if life was a video game. Playing on straight, you, like choose, chose your level of difficulty at the beginning of the video game, right? So if you choose straight white male, it's the easiest level on which to play the game. It doesn't mean you automatically win, as you can still have challenges, but it's not as hard as the uh, trans black immigrant uh, level of the game that you might play, right? Um, and that it doesn't mean one is going to succeed and one is is not. Um, but there are barriers, and we have to be aware of our privilege, and um, first of all, be aware that it's there, just like those values that we're embedding into our stuff. And then, the next level is, think about how we use our privilege. I don't know if you saw, there was this great video going around the socials recently of this woman, there was a woman being, a, a, a Latina woman was being yelled at in a drugstore by some racist, and this other white woman just went right in and just like, put herself in between them and said, no, you don't do that to people, you don't blah, blah, blah. And she screamed at the racist lady all the way out the store. She could do that because she's a white lady. Like, that's the kind of thing I can get away with. I'm a middle-aged mom. I can, do, I can do stuff that other people might get in trouble for doing. We were just talking right before about things that I'm, I'll, risks that I'll take because, because I do have more privilege. So, um, so, let's see. Yeah, Scalzi says, you can lose playing on the lowest difficulty setting but it's still the easiest one to win on. So um, back in 1989, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna, the next thing I'm gonna do is like name check two amazing, brilliant thinkers. One is Peggy McIntosh, um, who uh, was one of the first white people, like in our current generation at least, to sort of be talking about white privilege. She wrote a great essay called Unpacking the Backpack. Um, and she talks about, as you can see, she's, you know, like no one can deny that racism is a thing that exists, right? People might say, I'm not racist, but you know racism is out there. So if there's racism, it means there is also white privilege. Like, it's, a, it's simply a corollary. And she talks about all the different privileges that we're carrying around in this invisible backpack. We don't know we have it most of the time. We don't even think about it. But we are carrying around all these opportunities, all this privilege. Um, and again, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you are raised to think that you're the default, you just see yourself reflected back at yourself, and you see all your success as a result of all your hard work. And not to say that you didn't do hard work, but possibly you had a few things in your invisible backpack that were giving you a little boost, right? That maybe somebody else didn't have. Uh, maybe you had some connections. Maybe you had. Maybe your parents um, owned their house, and so you had a stable household growing up, where someone else had to move every year, change schools, and maybe have a less good educational experience, right? Like. There's so many ways that we benefit. For example, um, some of the things I don't have, I'm Jewish, I was pretty poor when I was growing up, I'm a woman. These things have added challenges to me, especially professionally in other parts of my life. But I'm also white, I'm cisgendered, heterosexual, I'm American, I'm fluent in English, I'm college educated, um, I'm middle class enough to have had sort of a computer when I was a kid. That's a huge help, right? Like to all of us here, some of us were already doing like writing little basic programs when we were 12, you know? Um, those things are advantages that I have that someone else might not have. A few other examples. Um, in Macintosh's essay, she lists about 25 different things to help um, to, to speak to people to understand their privilege. I'm gonna read a few of those things. We picked a few to like, examples. So, she's, so here's the things um, that, that show that whether you have white privilege. Um, if I can, or if you, racial privilege in general. Um, if I wish, I can arrange to be in the country of people of my race most of the time. I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. I can swear or dress in secondhand clothes or not answer letters, or I might add like have a tattoo or something like that without having people attribute these choices to bad morals or poverty or the illiteracy of my race. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race or to my, or to my gender, maybe in some other people's situations, right? Um, I can remain oblivious to the language and customs of people of color who constitute the world's majority without feeling in my culture any penalty for being so oblivious. Just floating through life, right? We've all seen that. 
So um, again, that's the, the unpacking the invisible knapsack of white privilege. Um, and, and I'll just say again, privilege is, is hard for some people to swallow. Because none of us really feel that privileged, most of us, unless we are actually grew up very rich, whatever. Um, but uh, my last name is Trump, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't feel like I've had all the advantages. Um, but almost everybody in the world has some privilege of some kind or other. Um, there's, just, there's so many different kinds. Which actually brings me to, what a great segue I just did by accident. <laughs> It's intersectionality, um, which is really about how we can't just look at one dimension of this. So in tech, the big pitfall we often get into is working on just women in tech. I mean, look who's here, right? Um, and it's easier for us, because look, we're white and whatnot. We have some other issues, but. Um, so um, also in 1989, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a professor of law, coined the term intersectionality. Um, and what this is about is we can't just do, and the women in tech is the best example. So many people wanted to say, well, we're working on improving representation of women in technology or in Drupal, and that's just, that's for everybody, so, so that benefits everyone. We don't have to also name these other issues. However, if you only are aligning with that one dimension, then you're not addressing the other many barriers that other kinds of people are really facing. There are other barriers for people of color, and there are other barriers for immigrants and people who don't speak English as their first language, and queer people, and there's lots of other barriers. So intersectionality is about looking at all these things and literally thinking about the intersections and not just looking at one dimension. Um, so otherwise, we end up just helping white women and a few other lucky people who, you know, who, who are who are good at the game, you know, at, the, at John Scalzi's game of life. Some people will, you know, excel at it anyway. Um, also, we all, we do like to quote Audre Lorde here. She had the, the best. There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because people don't live single issue lives. Um, now, a lot of people think that if everyone was just nicer and polite, then we would just all get along. There wouldn't be so much discrimination. Structural inequality is one reason that doesn't work. But the other reason is because of the paradox of tolerance, right? We can't just be nice to every single person because some people are making it more hostile or making it more difficult for us to be here. When we talk about the cost of excluding people from the community, that's a very real thing. Um, you know, there, we know people, including some in this room, who've been really pushed out of the Drupal community, and a lot, even I feel, I, I've been feeling the pressure myself. Like, I've decided I'm not going to Drupal Cons anymore. I feel this pressure, you know, just being pushed away. Um, and so we, the goal is not to include every single person because some people are actually making it more exclusive. Um, op, Nazis are the obvious example, and that's what uh, Karl Popper was talking about when he wrote this in 1945. He's a German author, right? Yes. Um, so Nazis are like the really obvious example. Do we have room for Nazis in the Drupal community? I really hope not. Um, and, um, but but it's, there's, there's many, many more levels. Um, you know, there, it's not just like you're a Nazi or you're, you're good or something. And it's not about being good. Um, but when people bring ideologies that cause the exclusion of other people, especially when they bring behavior that causes the exclusion of other people, we shouldn't tolerate that, right? So again, it's not our job. The, the, the goal is not maximum tolerance. It, it, sounds, it sounds kind of weird to say that, because tolerance is a good thing. Um, but the goal is not just ultimate tolerance. Um, and as I was working on this, an earlier version of this, I was like, I'm going to make a Venn diagram to illustrate this. It's pretty obvious. Tolerance can't include intolerance inside of it. So we can't include that. We can't tolerate that. Um, and there's a great essay um, by Greg Dunlap, who um, was doing, I think it was based on a keynote he had done it's called Stay for the Community. It used to be like part of the group, you know, come for the code, stay for the community. Is that, isn't that right? Um, and he talked just really clearly about how we ha there has to be a line somewhere. It's hard for us to say where the line is, and I'm glad I'm not in the community working group who does have to decide where that line is sometimes. I wish they would decide more often, but it's a tough job, but there has to be a line. If there's no line, and literally anybody, um, even sexists and Nazis and whatever, can be part of the Drupal community, a lot of us will be like, okay, see ya, right? So there's got to be a limit. I think that's, yeah, that's me. me. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through some numbers about the community, about 
uh, the sort of national developer population. These numbers come from the census, they come from the Department of Labor, they come from me watching every DrupalCon closing session and looking at the reported uh, diversity data. Uh, we've worked on these numbers for a while, so um, I'm gonna keep them kind of short and we're gonna oversimplify them because numbers are pretty, oh, numbers are pretty tough. Um, not everyone uh, polls the same, like surveys the same genders. Super hard to like have uh, commensurate data on those. Uh, a lot of communities don't look at racial diversity. They don't look at um, disability or gender or um, sexual orientation. So these numbers are messy. Um, the other reason statistics are kind of hard is because a lot of people who are marginalized in our community are also not protected legally around the world in all kinds of ways, right? So sometimes you don't actually wanna share this information. It's hard to get this information from folks and I am uh, not gonna be the one that's like, you need to tell me so I can have it in my presentation. But it is a real um, fear when news comes out from the administration about trans and intersex people. Like, I identify as non-binary and it freaks me out and maybe I don't wanna put that on your form and in your database that I don't know how secure that is, right? So these numbers are both hard to get and a little dangerous, um, but they're super important. Um, there was a study just released this week, I want to say, about uh, women in the workplace done by Lean In, and um, they specifically asked a bunch of women about how often are you the only person at your job? And they also asked women of color how often are you the only person of your race? And they asked queer women how often are you the only person of your sexuality? Uh, women in general, it was about 20% are the onlys. Uh, women of color was almost 50, and queer women it was like 78%. So it's a lot of the time in professional settings. And what they found is that women who are the only on their team are one and a half times more likely to leave, 80% um, likely to, are, or will experience microaggressions, uh, which is an insane number until you realize that all women, 60% uh, of all women experience them. Um, microaggressions are like small interactions on a day-to-day -day basis um, that often question your um, competence or make you feel like an outsider. And then women who are only support being sexually harassed at higher numbers. So. I don't know about you, but that's like not where I want to work. That's not the community I want to be part of. Um, and I think that this kind of uh, loneliness and isolation really does contribute to both attrition and people not wanting to come into the community. So it's important to see these numbers and to kind of really get a sense for what's happening with folks. Um, so first oversimplified number slide. Uh, when I say women here, I actually just mean not men, right? Yeah. So a lot of... Uh, a lot of surveys only ask women and men. Sometimes they say women, men, and other, or whatever. It's like really messy. I don't like it. It erases other genders, but it's the numbers we have to work with. So what we have here is open source is one and a half percent. So one in a hundred people are not men. In Drupal development, so that's people who are committing, these are commit credits on Drupal Dower, we're at seven percent. Uh, the US developer population, just in general, is at 32 percent, and frequently you will see uh, proprietary uh, systems having better gender representation than open source, uh, which we can talk about maybe during questions. And then, you know, 51 ish percent of the US population, according to the census. So we're not like the very bottom of the pile. <laughs> uh, I have another community I spend a lot of time in as a gamer that is about 2% like, women slash not men to men. Um, and it's a world of difference. Like, I love it there and I choose to go, but it's a world of difference. When you know that you can report a microaggression or anything to someone who may understand your situation versus to someone who doesn't, or uh, you might lose a job because they don't believe you. It's, it, these numbers, like, even one and a half to seven is a great improvement, but seven to 51 is, <laughs> there's some work to do. Um, in terms of people of color, we have US devs at 20%, OSS at 26 I don't know the difference there, why? And then the US population is 39%. This is just as much of like erasure and simplification in terms of race. Not everybody's um, using the same categories and Drupal doesn't record this information at all. Um, which I think in tech, we're really good at metrics and we're really good at measuring and we know that what you track will improve and we have systems for doing that and data-driven everything and we're awesome and we don't even track this number. And that's just, I don't know, uh, I think it's a big indicator of um, our willingness to really engage the question. Uh, similarly, 
disability, people with disabilities. We don't track. Uh, this wasn't included in the US Developer Department of Labor. Um, but OSS says in general, 4%. US population, almost 30%. So I mean, just like from a product perspective, one in three people might not be able to use your product. Um, we're just not coming anywhere near to, our, to, to really reflecting, you know, Drupal wants to do these ambitious projects and help everyone in the world. We don't look anything like most of the world. So uh, just the super oversimplified numbers. We do have like charts and all of the data that we use to make this. If you like really want to dig in, <laughs> I'm happy to share that with you later. But they're kind of like eye glazing in presentation. Um, so that's like all kind of a huge bummer and all that. But I think ultimately most Drupal people are very optimistic. I think the Drupal diversity and inclusion team is very optimistic. And we want to work to improve our community. Um, you might recognize Andy Byron, also in the white chick here. Um, about 10 years ago, she wrote an article about the Drupal community's values. And one of the values she brought up was that um, in open source communities, Drupal, like many open source communities, Drupal is a meritocracy. Um, so if you're talking and you're working and you're getting stuff done, you're going to be a lot more successful than people just kind of sitting around chatting about it. Um, little side note to this, uh, somebody actually brought up it was Ben, her... who was sitting oh, yeah. right there. There he is. Hi, yeah. Thanks for doing this. It's actually a better quote than what we summarized here. <laughs> he said, hey, doesn't meritocracy just kind of reinforce the status quo and the existing power structures? And Angie said, you know, yeah, you're right. Let's, we're going to change it. So she actually changed it to duocracy instead of meritocracy. Um, I think meritocracy is a very dearly held concept in open source and in tech in general that we are at the top of the pile because we're the smartest and we're the best and it was proven by all of the commits we made in the commit log. Um, but actually there's many ways that all of the structural inequality that Ruby is talking about is built into the way that we're measuring the merit of us. So I think um, in the spirit of duocracy rather than meritocracy, uh, we decided to do something about it. And when I say we, I mean Ruby and myself and a bunch of other folks, but especially <laughs> Nikki. Nikki really did this, this is Nikki Stevens. Um, who who uh, gave a session on diversity with Karen Cassio in New Orleans. Um, and then since then there was a buff and then there were meetings and all kinds of uh, things and kind of increasing momentum. And Nikki's kind of statement for why this needed to exist was to provide space for marginalized folks, people of color, women, uh, people who are differently abled or not neurotypical. I mean, basically whoever we don't see a lot of in the Drupal world, right? So that's sort of the definition of marginalized. Um, but uh, Nikki started this. This is a very long list of some of the things we're working to address. Uh, racism, sexism, ableism, we've talked a lot about also classism or transphobia, homophobia, ageism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, language barriers, discrimination based on body type or appearance, and other forms, because there's so much thing to go around. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, we really try to take the most intersectional approach we can using a lot of the principles that Ruby has been uh, describing. In terms of uh, who the active team is right now, there are eight leadership team members. The top row, we are the day-to-day -day leadership, leading meetings, getting stuff done in the issue queue. This is the advisory team. Ruby just stepped into the advisory role. We're so happy to have her there, although a little sad to not have her on leadership anymore. Um, so Nikki founded it in April at DrupalCon Nashville. Uh, Fatima took over as the leader, so she's the leader. She um, just became a Code for Canada fellow, which is super exciting, and could not make it today, but she's amazing. Um, two things about this slide. One, uh, sometimes there's like this terrifying SJW DDI cabal that's like out to ruin <laughs> Drupal. There's not, it's this. <laughs> and if you would like to discuss issues you have, like there's my Twitter handle, <laughs> whatever like you know where I am I just think it's uh, important to like we try to be as accountable for ourselves and our kind of micro community as we can um, and then the other thing about this slide is like it's a pretty white group uh, we have other kinds of diversity in the group and I think not to explain it away or to justify it but we reflect the community from which we come so even though Drupal doesn't take those numbers right doesn't track those things like this is what Drupal looks like in a lot of ways, right? It's a little bit more diverse, but it's pretty similar. So um, just two things I think that are important about our composition. 
and we have the privilege to be able to do this work, yes. but some people can't for various reasons. Yeah. Um, so just briefly, the kinds of things that we work on as a group. We have weekly meetings on Slack. We do a lot of community building, trying to like organize social events at cons and events. Um, we do try to offer safe space and support for people in our Slack as well as at events. So like at DrupalCon, people who don't feel super comfortable there, um, we have like an imperfect but ever improving security back channel where there's kind of like a buddy system and we have a hotline to the people who are in charge. Um, and then we also, community leaders will come and say, how can my event be more inclusive? How can my job listing be more inclusive? That kind of thing. And general rabble rousing, which probably everyone's, I don't know, it's my favorite part of the game. <laughs> I won't speak for anyone else. Um, and then we have initiatives, these are more formal. They're on Drupal.org, as came up with this beautiful screenshot of Drupal.org. Um, so these are sort of specific activities that we're working on, long-term projects. DBI Contrib team is here uh, to try to help people contribute back to the Drupal project to get that 7% number up to like find any data at all about other types of diversity. We're working on the Jettafield model right now, which when the D7 port is finished, it will go on to D.O and we'll have like my gender will be represented on Drupal.org for the first time ever, which I'm super excited about. Yeah, someday that'll get done. Uh, so be like, that kind of stuff I'm doing. Uh, we do a lot of events like this. We have pronoun stickers on the table. Um, and our little heart logo, if you want those, they're just right out in the hallway. Resource library for like just learning about diversity things. Sometimes it gets a little tiring to explain stuff or whatever, you can go look. Um, presentations like this one, two uh, new and very exciting initiatives that I think will have a really like material impact on marginalized people in our community are speaker training and support, which is uh, we're bringing some stuff from WordPress that's had uh, very like tangible results in their community. And then job search support. And a lot of times being marginalized means it's harder to make networks, um, harder to be taken seriously professionally. So we are um, trying to like make up for that gap. Uh, ways to get involved. Come to the meetings. Drupal Slack, 9 a.m. Pacific. It's free. It's all text. Um, we also have a chat channel. Yes. So just come hanging out with your people, you know. Yeah. So come hang out with us. Um, our issue queue, if that's your style, we have the resource library if you want to add stuff. We're on Twitter. And if, if you want to work on gender field or anything like that, we have contributing get some contributing people here today. So, lightning speed. Good. That was pretty good. Yeah, we still got 13, yeah. 12 and a half minutes. Oh, yes. Um, so, you said you have print on stickers. I didn't see them at the registration table. That would have been a great place to get them for sure. Yes, yeah. Badcamp should I've, do that. I've had, well, okay. Well, I'm just saying that I've been to other non drupal events where they have that stickers yeah. at the registration where you yeah. get your name tag, and that would be something to kind of uh, add to your toolkit of things to talk to event organizers about. Sure, for sure. Thank yeah. you. If anybody wants to suggest that to Badcamp organizers, you know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was also. Had, I was so many events lately that have them. Right? Yeah, I, I mean the nonprofit tech conference has them. Little yeah. ribbons you add to your badge. I, was, I, I mentored in Django Girls um, mm -hmm. event recently, and sure. that was like a big thing for them. Yeah. Well, hopefully yeah. for next year. Yeah. Works coming out. Um, yeah. Are you going to make this deck available online? Sure. Yeah, definitely. It's already. Right. I say we is have. It, there's a yeah, another, an older version of it um, is already posted. I think maybe even on the Bad Camp website because I was searching for something in our thing and I found our presentation when I was searching for it. <laughs> What's our source? Um, ourselves. But um, we have made we we're always iterating and improving it a little bit. So um, we'll probably update that page, but also we'll we'll post it on our website and tweet it. Mm -hmm. So another thing as one of the things you can do is just follow us on Twitter. It's just Drupal Diversity. Um, our website doesn't really have a blog, but should someday. Um, but so, it, so you can't find it on our website, but I'll put it there and then tweet a link to it. Yeah. This um, is also the same session that we were selected to give in Seattle. Yeah, like it'll evolve because that's... Also, there's a big slide at the end of this that we're not going to make you look at where we barf out all the links of everything that we've talked about in here. Um, and so, that would, so if you do look at the slides online, you'll get all those links as well. We got time. Yeah. So I'm... Um, Disappointed, but not really surprised that there are more here. I, I feel like the people that, that come to this type of session are the people who are not the, you know, people who need to hear it. 
So preaching to the choir, beautiful yeah. church. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's right, totally. Um, so I'm curious, like, what do you guys think about, like, how do we get the people with more privilege to become more aware of their privilege by attending a session like this? Yeah. That's something I've been thinking about because we've both given this talk at other camps as well, and I think yours maybe not as much, but in my case, I felt the same way like that I was uh, preaching to the convert. And the, the way I think of it is that people need to take their medicine, sort of, but nobody wants to, you know. Um, so there's been some discussion about, in some ways, kind of how to market this, um, or a different um, way to frame this talk, um, possibly just in ways that. Um, so that people who, the kind of people who need to hear it, well, it'll sound more valuable to them. Because I think those folks, when they hear diversity, they're like, oh, that's, that's for diverse people. The others, those non-default people, right? That's for them. Um, so the idea is, you know, is to is, is figure out ways to communicate that, um, that, that makes those folks who need to hear it, um, to trick them to come into the room. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? Approach could be to not have to compete with technical sessions. Oh, interesting idea. Like, like, like we should be keynoting. keynoting. <laughs> <laughs> I totally think you should. Or it should be, yeah, something like a keynote. Like it's at the beginning or end of the day or during lunch where people have idle time where they're like, oh, well, maybe I'll go check it out. Versus like, oh, I really have to go to this. Thing. That would also require the investment of camp organizers, which I'm going to be honest, they've, they've always accepted our talks. We've never had a Drupal diversity and inclusion talk not accepted where we've proposed it. Um, but at the same time, you know, no one's ever been like, can we have stickers? Can we have, you know, pronoun stickers or something like that? So I'd like to see a little more proactive initiative from the organizers to make that happen too. But it's a great, it's a good idea. And again, if people, if that idea trickles up, maybe we can yeah, make that happen. Sure. So, um, I've had a number of jobs throughout my career, and just about everywhere I've worked, there's been an annual sort of diversity training, and, you know, of varying quality. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now, at an or another organization I volunteer with, uh, an assistant crew leader for doing trail work, we had to do a little diversity workshop, which was awful. But anyway, <laughs> bad um, diversity workshops are the worst. They are the worst. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they kind of just really rise. But yeah. having been through that. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering whether we need to think about having some mandatory diversity training. If we can find a good video that everybody can watch that would be half an hour or something like that. And have, a, have some mandatory diversity training, at least for the leaders of the of the. Oh, I love that. I just realized we should be restating the questions for the oh, recording too. Yeah. So the suggestion is um, to have the way corporations do to have a mandatory diversity training for leaders in the Drupal community. At least for the leaders. That's actually yeah. something we've talked about before. Yeah. It would be amazing. I, I mean, every company just about now in the U.S. requires that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I mean, it would take a long time to get into like my feelings about what the Drupal Association is and isn't doing about diversity. I'm not talking about the Drupal Association. I'm talking about the Drupal community requiring it of the leaders in the community. Uh huh. I, I, the, yeah. The is hopeless. So yeah. anyway, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, you had something. So yeah, this actually kind of flows right off of what you said in a few way, um, and it. it coming off of what you were talking about about the session and like who should be in the room and stuff like that, right? Um, it made me think of something that I was recently looking at, uh, the Ally Skills Workshop. Have you heard of this? No. no. So this is by, uh, it's called Frame Shift Consulting. Um, and a Valerie Aurora, who's one of the people who was at the ADA initiative. Oh, okay, heard. yeah. Um, so she and some other consultants currently work in like big tech uh -huh. to train people on ally skills. It's not called a diversity workshop. It's an ally skills workshop Good. and it's like, now that we know about bias and reading the page, what can we do to stop it? The ally skills workshop teaches simple everyday ways for people to use their privilege and influence to support people who are targets of systemic oppression in their workplaces and communities. And I'm wondering if that kind of thing, like whether, so they actually distribute the curriculum, they oh, have a video cool. that you can watch. I haven't watched it yet. I have some skepticism, <laughs> just because it's like for big, big tech, uh -huh. those are different issues in mind. But I like the way they're framing it, right? It's not just like training on diversity, it's like training you how to be an ally. Like it's specifically for allies, it's not for the diverse people, it's for folks right. to consider the, I mean, I consider myself an ally to lots of people. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah. Like whoever is coming in, you're the ally. 
And the funny thing is, it has to be voluntary. They don't let anyone, uh, they don't let any uh, company force their people into the screening. They're like, 100% like, the attendance must be voluntary or it's not gonna work. So, exactly. so it's kind of flowing off of that, like what is, what is it when it's forced? What is it when it's voluntary? What is it when it's diversity training versus like something more proactive of what you do as a person of privilege or power mm -hmm. to yeah. support others? That is a great cool. idea. For the recording, I'm just going to say, this is a great suggestion to do ally training, and there's an organization that does it. And I love the framing of ally. I mean, there's, there's, there's things that are problematic about it, but it's really helpful for getting to those folks who feel like they're not quote unquote diverse. I know it's a ridiculous statement, but um, because it gives them a place. Because another thing, another thing that we hear from people is, is that folks feel guilty. They don't want to come here and be made to feel bad. Um, which is, a, 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 you know, problematic. Um, but the point is, this is something po proactive and positive that they can do. And if they and they and if they think of themselves as someone who cares about this these things, then here's something that they can be doing. That's a great idea. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we have three minutes. Yeah. Ruby, I don't know if you want to address this, but. Um, I think you said you decided not to go into any further Drupal cons. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not saying never ever, but um, I don't really feel safe and supported um, in the uh, big Drupal space. I don't think there's a mechanism within Drupal to make sure that it's a safe place for people. As you all may know, that we have a community working group, which is a great thing, and it's at least it's a good idea and the purpose of it is to deal with interpersonal conflict so if two people get into a spat in the issue queues or at an event they can go to the community working group which can help resolve the conflict but the community working group does not address systemic issues right and microaggressions and things like that often stem from those systemic things so you know you just feel all the time you just start to feel kind of worn down um, there's certain people that you're gonna see at DrupalCon that you know of as bad actors and you know the community's not doing anything about them. Um, I think, um, sorry not to say Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, the community working group was founded to, to mediate conflict, as Ruby said, um, but it has been pushed into service to also mediate abuse. And I don't think that's a thing. I don't think you should be mediating abuse. And I think, um, I totally respect the fact that the working group has like a very standardized process for taking these conflicts. And uh, you know, if I'm just like being mad at someone because I don't want to use Slash and they want to, <laughs> whatever, like there should be, I, I'm totally fine with their process for that. I think the unfortunate part, and I, like I, and I'm fortunate for the CWG and for the people involved and for pretty much everyone, is that we as a community, rather than building an actual mechanism for dealing with Abuse, and I don't just mean like microaggressions. I mean people getting assaulted and um, harassed. We don't always have a good mechanism for that as a community. Um, that has nothing. I'm not saying that's why Ruby's not going, but no, it's just something no, it, is, it is though. Yeah, like I just it's something I've been thinking about. Like it's great that the community working group does what they do, but there is more work to be done, and we haven't really built the mechanism in the community to do this. So like even though I don't think I've been, I can't think of any time I've been directly harassed at a Drupal event, but I've seen, I'm aware that it's happened to other people, and so that makes me know that that's the kind of thing that could happen, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, that was, it was a good question. I probably shouldn't get too, you know, <laughs> it's recorded. <laughs> yeah. Um, or do you wanna? Okay. So um, I want to thank all the people who've helped make this. Uh, presentation, as I said, it's been iterating and growing, and a lot of people have contributed good ideas to this. Um, who, you, know, you, fit your, you don't only see their faces, and they've done um, really good work here. And I really appreciate you all coming because now you're yes, armed you. to go that out and do this here. work. Um, I'm, I'll be here through part of tomorrow. I think you're leaving early tomorrow. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. Like, stop me in the hall if you want to chat. Be happy to talk about whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, all right, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.